My Bible says, and yours does too, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Do not leave you on understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths and make your paths straight. And I trust you more than a memory verse to you, but an actual way of living, acknowledging God in all of our ways and trusting him to straighten out our paths. We have open Sundays from time to time where no one invites us to speak. Just kidding. And we pop into churches, build relationships, at least in ministry, and this Sunday was one of those Sundays. So we pray that God would direct us where to go today. Had no direct answer uh, as of yesterday morning until I picked up my phone and had a text from Pastor Doug. And we said, now, now we know where we're going to go. And so God answered prayer to bring us here this morning. So we believe, we believe that we're here by God's appointment. And I trust you see that as God fleshes out things in your life, you wear after that that God is sovereign, cares about your life, orchestrates details of your life to, to be where he wants you to be. So that's a reality that I trust God in. So we're glad to be here this morning to bring you to you the word. And uh, we really enjoyed our time that Saturday to be with you for your family day camp. Kind of a hot day, if I remember, a little bit of a hot day, and enjoyed it. But the fellowship was sweet. We really enjoyed our time, and uh, it's good to be back this morning, share God's word with you. I remember my unsaved lost days. I remember them well. Those years, uh, 28 years of them actually of being lost. Uh, my story was that I was a generational Lutheran, had a good mom and dad, and. <coughs> had a moral home, and I, I am grateful to God for that. I was not into drugs or drinking or all the stuff that a lot of kids would do, and I was spared from that. And I felt pretty proud that I wasn't, to be honest with you, but I liked being in church. Uh, we met in, in high school and in, in church, church choir, so I liked being in church. I was uh, probably like Cornelius, that type of an unsafe person who, though I was lost, had, was, I was considered as a devout person, who he feared God, and he gave, and he prayed, but he was not saved. And that would have been me. It would have been Sandy, did our story. So that was the type of sinners that we were. And, but we learned that God loved us in spite of that arrogant, self-righteous sin. And God showed that by giving his son to put him on a cross to show that he loved us. And he also showed he loved us by sending people into our lives that knew Christ and knew that we didn't. So in our journey of moving out to the West Coast and living along the Columbia River and building a hydroelectric project and then Ketchikan, Alaska, building a hydro project there, God brought people into our life that cared about us, that wanted to introduce us to Christ. And so we're grateful that God loved us by sending his son and by sending people that cared about us. And so a couple got us into a Bible study and uh, we were just so impressed. We didn't have a clue what all of it meant, but God was drawing us to himself and we weren't saved yet, but God used them. And a preacher knocked on our door at Ketchikan, Alaska. We went to a Baptist church for the first time. Had been growing up in big liturgical Lutheran churches. My, the church I was confirmed in was in Minneapolis in the church of 8,000 people. I figured the most towns in Iowa. My confirmation class was hundreds of people. And the big trumpet voluntary and the big pompous circumstance of this little dinky Baptist church, but we walked in and we were just amazed. Had no clue what the gospel meant, but this was real to us. People sang, and we noticed that they, they each brought their own copy of the Bible. That was new to us. <laughs> there was always a pulpit Bible that nobody read or a confirmation Bible that had a zipper on us. So you don't read it. And people had copies of the Bible, and we looked at them, and there were marks like this, and sticky notes, and finger oils, like they actually read them. And we said, this is real, and God used them in our journey. God used a deacon who asked if we knew for sure we were saved, and I lied and said yes, because I wasn't, and didn't want to admit it. God used a preacher during a mission conference in 1983 to preach the gospel about sin. <clears throat> And God, the, the, the verse that God used to convict me the most, there is no difference. All of us are sin. And I remember thinking, I'm no better than a drunk in the gutter. And I had seen them, or at least on a train. And I was no better than them. And God pointed me to God, pointed me to Christ. I put my trust in him by the grace of God. I became a believer in the fall of 1983. Sandy was saved later that week. I golf with Jack on 
on Monday, Jack is a deacon at the Church of Carol that we pastor for 23 plus years, right here, 23, not 24, but not 23, 23 plus years. And uh, Jack is a deacon there, and I golf with him every fall and on occasion. And Jack's story was way different than mine. When we met Jack, and he walked into our church that Sunday morning with his wife, Teresa, and Carol, referred to by a mutual friend, they came to church because their grandson, Caden, needed God. That's why they came. And so we met them, came to church a couple of times, and I thought, I need to go see him. So I drove out into the country one Sunday afternoon after they come a couple of times and to, just, to acquaint myself with Jack. And so came to his acreage, and his wife said he's down the road. They're mowing the dishes. Why are you mowing the dishes? That's where peasants live. I'm sorry. I just couldn't help to bring it up. Anyway, he's mowing his dishes, and he hops in the car to give a ride back to his, his, his home, and uh, he used profanity about every other word just in conversation. That's how he talked. Wasn't mad, wasn't angry, and I had to roll down the window, let all the blue smoke out, you know, that type of a thing. Now, I've heard a lot of that on construction sites and lumberjacks. I, I, I knew about it, but it was, yeah, it was what it was. And we, I talked a little bit. He'd been to church twice, and I dropped him off and let him go, and I thought, I don't think he even knows who I am. Now, you preach twice, he should remember at least who you are, right? It was embarrassing. I found out later he had no clue who I was. But then the church wife had said that from him. So I went back a second time and didn't seem to connect well. And just didn't, and I said, let's just, let's just let them be for a couple of months and see what happens. So we prayed. And so I'd never done that before, but it wasn't working. We just let them be and prayed that God was doing work. And uh, we just let them know. A couple months later, they showed up on a Wednesday night with their grandson. Because Caden needed God. So on a Wednesday night, they show up with their grandson. Jack and Teresa did. And um, Caden goes to Pat's Club, to Sandy Led, and Caden gets saved not long after that. He comes out, and Jack says, wow, Caden's a different kid. I said, I know. Isn't that great? And never told him really why. I just let him figure it out. He noticed there was a radical difference in Caden's life, and Sandy presented the gospel every fall and throughout the year, so Caden came to Christ and Jack knew the difference. And so I offered, we offered to Jack and Teresa to, you know, where do you go from here? We offered to do a John study with them. We brought them here before to get into their home, and they said, I said, Jack, you want to, be, you want to do a study with Sandy and I? We'll come to your home and spend several weeks going through the Bible about what it means to eternal life. He said, what he said? He said, you would do that? I would do that. It was concept of preachers that we just live behind pulpits, both ourselves in offices, and don't have a real life outside of that. And so that shattered that view that we had of preachers. So we came to their home, they came to our home, back and forth, and around a table in their dining room, after, some, after several weeks, Jack and Teresa put their trust in Christ to save them. On our first meeting with them, the first lesson, Teresa said, I am so embarrassed. I said, why? She said, I know nothing about God. I said, that's why we're here. Now they both got saved, and, and Jack is now a deacon, loves Christ. And those, those, we have a different story. But the same result because of the same Savior, right? And all of us have a story of our unsaved life. It might have been at age five or, or later in life. Jack was 61. He just turned 70, 61 when he got saved. He was an intelligent reprobate. Uh, he, he was a drunk, and AA cleaned him up, but something was missing, he said, which was God in his life was missing. And um, God brought a life together, and Jack has never, ever been different. And God loves him, too, in his sin. And God loved me in my sin. Different types of sin, but no difference. We all needed Christ, and so... God showed his love for me by sending his son and sending someone into my life to share Christ with me and with that. And so my message today is God, Jesus loves lost people and so should we. We learned in one verse we read tonight that today that he has compassion on those that were hungry. He cares. I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 9. It's an account of something in Jesus' life that showed his compassion for lost people and what he did about it. And if you know Christ, you have a story 
of how God brought you to his son and how he loved you and how he died for you and how it radically changed every fiber of your being. Your nature, your destiny was transformed the day that you came to Christ, and nothing's been the same ever since, right? And there are people all around us that Jesus still loves. And he wants us to care about them in some measure like he does and bring the God to us. Let's just read together Matthew chapter 9. You read along as I read Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the village is teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. The word compassion here means his, his inner hurt for them. This is like bowels of mercy, his, his inner hurt for them. Because they were harassed and helpless, one translation said, distressed and dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labor, the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest would send out labor into his harvest. He hurt for them, living a life without him, hurt them. And the life was miserable. Harassed, helpless, scattered, aimless. And, his, and he compassionate them because of that. And they needed him. So my message today is from this text primarily, Jesus loves lost people and so should we. If you know him, you remember not being a part of him. You remember that what that was like in your story. And someone cared, someone prayed, probably multiple people, to bring you the good news that Christ loved you and died for you and made you one of his children. And it radically changed everything. A part of that everything is now we have a burden to bring the same message to people that still need him. To that I must pray. Father, we thank you today for the joy of a new day. We're grateful for the gift of life. Father, you give us life and breath. You've given us eternal life in Christ to those of us that know him. The joy of having sins forgiven, the burden lifted, a life of purpose and meaning. And I'd like to share with those who do not yet know our Savior. Father, today, give us a love and a heart for lost people. Well, we probably can't ever love people like you do. We can love them to some degree. And then be the kind of people who bring them the message of good news. So, Father, bless this time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at this passage, pull something out of it. Narratives are a little bit tricky because we don't have directives like doctrinal instructions. They're tricky. We can pull out of them, I think, principles that we can make a point about. So let's do them today. And we look at what does it look like to make a disciple, to, to care about lost people, like Jesus did. Number one is to see people as lost. That's point number one. You should have notes in front of you, half sheet of paper that will help you to kind of follow along. You to see people as lost. That's what he saw them. It says seeing the multitudes, he saw them as shepherdless. Harassed, helpless, needing a shepherd, needing a savior. He saw the spiritual condition. Now, among them would have been like mechanics, lawn care specialists, attorneys, carpenters, bricklayers. But he saw them in their spiritual condition. He saw them as people that were lost needing him. That's how he saw them when he saw the multitudes. Now, Paul had the same reaction when he went to Athens. It says in Acts 17 that his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idolatry. And it really burdened him when he saw people as lost. Now look at me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And th this, is, this is really significant in how we view people when we see them. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we begin the, the reading in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll recognize some of the verses here. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. 
Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him as no longer. Therefore, if any man be a Christ, a new creation. The old has passed away, the, 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 the new has come. That verse we get. But the context of this is things are different when we're saved. We're a new creation, a new home in heaven, a new nature. We've experienced that. But something that's going to do is how we see people. We no longer regard them merely as flesh and blood people that just do stuff. They're spiritual beings with an eternal destiny. That's how we now see people as lost people. When we came to Christ, my life wasn't a mess. I wasn't a druggie. I wasn't a, an adulterer. I wasn't all those things. I'm proud of that, but I didn't have that history. What did change was the love for the Word of God. And what did change was the love for God's people. And a, and, a, and a desire to please him, and a burden lifted of sin. But the biggest thing was now I saw people as lost and saved versus church going and not church going. And I remember as a Lutheran, a good church goer, um, we were good Lutherans. There were bad ones. We were good ones. And we came not just Christmas and Easter. We were there every Sunday, multiple services, sang in choir, gave to the organ fund. We were good Lutherans. And we despised bad ones who only came on Easter and, and Christmas. And I would hope the fact would lay into them and Easter say, shame on you for only coming on Easter to wear your big hat. And he never did that. I felt bad. I was so arrogant. We were good ones. But here, and so I judge people by good or bad, moral, immoral, responsible, irresponsible, church going or not. Now I saw them as saved and lost. That was a huge shift in thinking for me. And it ought to be for us. Now they're saved and lost people. That dramatically, I saw them as lost. And that led to a burden for people that we knew now we saw as lost versus just not good Lutherans. So we made a point to drive up to Bloomington, Minnesota from Ankeny and visit Sandy's sister and her husband to share Christ with them. Because we knew they were not just bad Lutherans, they were lost people like we were. There's no difference. And so we went to the purpose of sharing Christ with them. We had no training in this, no experience, just a burden to share Christ with them, to make, as I said later, to make an appeal for them, because we are, they give it a ministry of reconciliation, and the word of reconciliation, to, to, to appeal to them that God would make an appeal through us. That was our burden. So we went up and had supper with them, and prayed that God would open a door for the gospel, and we ate supper, nothing happened, went to the living room and sat, and maybe God would open the door, and nothing happened. We're standing at the door ready to leave. And it's like God says, you're not done yet. I said, I know, I'm working on it. You know, that little burden from inside. And so we stood at the door and I said, can I ask you a question? They said, sure. I said, do you consider yourself to be a Christian? And they said, yeah. I said, why would you say that? That's a better question. It's a dumb question because everybody's a Christian, right? And so one of them said, I was baptized as an infant. The other one said, I've always been a Christian. I said, well, that's not true to myself. So I said, okay. Can I ask you a different question? They said, sure. I said, do you consider yourself to be born again? And they said, no. And I read just enough of John 3 to know that whatever it is, you've got to have it. You must be born again. And they said, no. I said, Ooh. I said, why would you say that? And they said, our pastor says you don't have to be. Okay, no, that's what you're doing, right? My back is to the door, and they just run out the door and say, see you later. And God says, you're not done yet. I said, I know. I'm working up the courage to ask the next question. <laughs> I say, no, Jesus says, you must be born again. That would mean your pastor is wrong. Oh. They kick us out of the house. They don't ever hear it again. The strain of relationship for a while. I might try something different years later, but it was a faithful sharing of the gospel, and sometimes people just don't want to believe yet. And so we left, hoping it had been different. Our relationship has been mended a bit, but still not much on. Now, they've been to our church a couple of times, so they've heard the gospel. Had a co-worker um, that worked with me at UPS. I had a, one, one was a Bible college student, a faith student, another one was an unsaved Lutheran guy. 
and he would we would travel together back and forth, commute to work at UPS. That was a job of choice back in the day. And Terry was kind of a captive audience where maybe not like Paul to the Philippians in the jail, not chained to us, but kind of locked in our car for about 15 minutes each way. So we were gracious, but we shared the gospel with Terry about what it meant to be saved and what didn't save you, like good works don't. And I knew he, he's a loser like me. I knew what he's thinking. And finally he said, you know, I get what you're saying. It's not of works. It's not of this. It's only through Christ. But if what you're telling me is true, that would mean my path is wrong and I can't, begin, I can't believe that. And so we pleaded with him more and we parted ways. And I don't know what happened to Terry, but those were, for, but those were first attempts because we saw the wrong people. Our grand, one of our granddaughters, Addie, turned five back in March. And she got saved on her birthday, March 28th, 2022, Addie got saved. And so she was in the Sam Club parking lot over in Ankeny with her mom, Amy, her youngest daughter, and pleaded with her that she didn't want to go to hell, wanted to go to heaven, and Amy put her off and say, We'll talk when we get home, kind of just defer, because some kids here just want to do what mom and dad want them to do. Just careful. And she persisted and persisted. No, mom, she's okay. So she shared the gospel with her, how Christ died for her, and she believed it. She asked Jesus to say, We're in their car. And much as well as we can tell, she truly put her trust in Christ and was born again. Because she started pestering her younger brother Phil that he needed to go to heaven and ask Jesus to save him. The moment she said, Sin, you got to get saved, or you're going to go to hell. I mean, this is. And Finn didn't like that didn't understand it, but immediately she had a burden for lost people. So they go into Sam's Club, and they're being served, I think, like a piece of pizza. So she talks to the gal serving them. And she said, do you believe in Jesus, or do you want to go to hell? Now, it wasn't antagonistic, but wow, from a five-year-old? So something happened that day. It became that, and then she, then she went on just playing with her toys. That was her new nature. She saw people differently. So we, it matters how you see people. I, I believe that this gives us a burden for them by seeing them as lost. We get caught in the team of life, seeing them as lost. I think we're more diligent praying for them, bringing them the gospel, and behaving differently around them because they're lost people. And what I do might put a barrier for them to come to Christ, like my neighbor. On one side of me is a, is a neighbor that doesn't know how to take care of their lawn. We'll talk about that in a bit. The other side of the guy who does keep a nice lawn, but they, they do foster dogs. And we live in a cul-de-sac with a very tiny small yard and a very big backyard. So our, our front yard is really tiny. And they get foster dogs for a time. And some are better than others. Some are yippy, some are quiet, but they all have to do their business somewhere. And so they have one tree in the middle of their tiny little yard. It's not even as big as this section. This is their yard smaller than this. And next is my little sliver of yard and my driveway within walking distance of the leash they attach their dog to. Just use a shorter leash, I'm thinking. So the dog is, I got to know the dog, and I made friends with, I think, I, I made friends with the dog, and he liked me, he wagged his tail at me, but he would do his business in my yard. A little sliver, a three-foot piece of yard. And I would, and I, I said, oh, I can't go over this stair. Oh, man. So I thought, what do I do? Three options. One was something I did like 30 years ago in my unsaved days. When that happened, let's pick it. Was that 40 years ago? Yeah, so I'm off a decade. Yeah. I'm really young. To my shame, I took that pile and put it on the guy's doorstep next door to tell him I didn't like this. Never saw the dog again. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. That was just wrong. Check that one out. Plan number two would be to put it on their yard so they could deal with it, but their yard was shorter than mine, and they would know I did it, and that just would not, it would not be right. Just clean it up. Get the, get the throwaway gloves, like quadruple bag. Because this is Monday, garbage day is Friday. If you say my garbage for four days, I just was struggling with this. So I picked it up, quadruple bagged it, and just got rid of it. 
They're unsafe people. It matters. I didn't want to lose a Dr. Whitney because of dog stuff. And so I found out the next day his wife, Stephanie, came up and she said, I know what you did yesterday. You just took care of it. Thank you for your grace. I came home late, noticed that out of your yard, was going to pick it up, but I ran out of time. Thank you for just taking care of it. I appreciate that. It makes us act differently around them. We have to see people with loss. Number two, we have to serve them. <laughs> Jesus was serving these people. If you look at Matthew chapter 9, go back to our text. Jesus was serving them. And he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life and ransom for many. It went beyond the cross to serving people. He fed them. He healed them. He, he ministered to them. He cared about their physical and emotional and spiritual needs. He served them. If Jesus can serve them, he sent us to be servants as well. If you look at Matthew chapter 9 again, he said he went about the villages and cities and, and he healed every disease and every affliction. We found out today that he fed them when they were hungry because he was compassionate on them. So we don't heal by direct healing, but we can care about people just find a way to serve them. We don't always think about the gospel as a, as a way to serve people, but we, maybe before we tell them about Jesus, we tell them that we love them. And we find ways to serve them. Paul did this. Look at look with me in in First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine. And Paul, did, let's just read it. First Corinthians chapter nine. We have to find a way to serve them. First Corinthians chapter nine. This is a very insightful passage of how Paul viewed what it takes to win people to Christ. Look at First Corinthians nine and beginning in verse nineteen. He said, though I am free from all, meaning Paul had liberty in Christ, not burdened to be anybody's servant, but I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jew to those under the law. I became as one under the law, but though not be myself under the law, that I might win those that are under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but lawless, under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak, and become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some, and do it for the sake of the gospel. The key phrase is, I say, I say, I say I made myself a servant of all. What this does not mean, that the end justifies the means, that we be compromised as an order, we don't accommodate sin or condone sinful activity. We don't become a lawbreaker to win people to Christ. But it does mean that Paul's heart was to win people to Christ, and he never lost that. He willing to sacrifice his personal freedom and restrict them and maybe limit them to reach them. He's willing to accommodate social customs different than his to enter into people's life to win them. You may have heard of the missionary Hudson Taylor back in the 1800s who was from England, had a burden for the Chinese people, so he went to China and he dressed like he would dress in England as a preacher, which at that point was a black flowing robe. That was his approach in China. He found out when he went to village to village that they referred to him as the black devil. That's not going to work. <laughs> He said, it's my robe. So he got rid of the robe, shaved his forehead, had a big ponytail coming down, and had more of what a Chinaman would wear in the day, to look like them. He lost a lot of his base of support in England. He said, we don't do that. We want to make them like us. I said, no. This is what drove him. He became, in a sense, one of them to win them. And, and, and there's records that hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ during his 30 or 40 year ministry. And then there's results of that even to this day. Be willing to mingle with people, enter into their lives, people that are different than us, get outside of our comfort zone for the sake of the gospel. To make ourselves a servant of how can I serve people to win them? Somehow enter their life, care for them, serve them, to find a connection that God would open a door. It's not usually on our thinking to think this way, but we have to find a way to serve them. I've got a pastor friend 
just always have a burden for people evangelistically. But his method approach was typically a big church event to get people to come to, like a Sunday school push and other type of things, which was fine. But it just wasn't producing much fruit. It just didn't attract many people. And so we had talked about, as a fellowship, connecting with people on a personal level, getting involved in their lives, and making it personal instead of institutional. And he began to see a different approach to evangelism. So he said, you know, I need to try to reach my neighbor by befriending them and serving them. So he, he thought, you know, he just brought his neighbor broccoli in the garden. That was new to him. That led to a Bible study, the husband got saved, the, the wife had been saved, and it became a new way of approach of leading people to Christ. He bumped it next level. He, he has an EMT friend that he wants to reach with. So he rides along in his ambulance. Uh, I, I would never do that. So he rides along in the ambulance, and there are levels of certification, I guess, among EMTs. One is you have to learn how to put in IV. The next level is put an IV in while the ambulance is on the road. That's the next level of certification, which his friend was not getting. And just imagine IV and like this. And so he said, you know what? Just jab me. Jab me till you get it. I'll ride along. I said, wow. That's this. He's serving him, entering in his life. He said, you just poke me till you get your certification. He understands it to serve him. So we have to find some way to serve people to try to win them. Number three, we have to spend time with them. And so we see them as lost. We find a way to serve them. And we spend time with them. Jesus spent time with lost people. He, he didn't sin with them, but he could sit with them. You look here in Matthew chapter 9 again. That he went about the villages and the cities and he interacted with them. And even earlier in, in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 9, if you look at verse 10, uh, it says, And Jesus reclined at the table in Matthew's house. He ate with him. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came, were reclining at Jesus and his disciples. He was eating a meal with sinners. Of course, the Pharisees couldn't stand it. And they said, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does, he, I, why does he mingle with them? And when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the right of sinners to repent. He had friends who were sinners. He was called a friend of sinners. He was your friend before he was your savior. He even invited himself to someone's house. A little guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Why did they sing the song for you? Does that your memory? I'm going to your house Tuesday. I couldn't resist the little bit of him. And Zacchaeus said, that would be cool. Zacchaeus was interested, hungry, he came to his house, and his whole house came to Christ. You can invite unsafe people to your house. In fact, a good way to connect with people is to invite them to, into your life a little bit. To your home, to meet your family, and just have a meal, and that's it. But that might just be it. You don't even have pressure to share God with them. It might be too early. If they're going to die, you need to tell them. But maybe that's it. You invite them to your home, and you're like when they come to church. I would like to have things here where people come to church, and God will bring some in from time to time. We lived in Carroll, probably two thirds of people that were saved were people that came to church. But none of them were saved at church. They're saved in their home or our home or someone else's home. There's a whole world of people that never come to church until they're saved. In fact, that's kind of in the process of going making disciples. We don't expect them to come here. We have to go to them. So some out have to be a place to connect with them. And that can be an activity, a recreation, or maybe even your home. Invite them into your life. Have them over for a meal. Offer them something to help them. Go to the activities of their kids, even if it's soccer. Oh. It's not my favorite sport. Go to their kids' soccer games. Find out what they like to do and get interested in what interests them. Don't you like it when someone does it to you? And, and our neighbor across the street, his name is TJ, and we have a common interest in camping and shooting, and so we're building on that. And he just bought a food truck. 
quit a job and his wife is from the Philippines, they want to have, it sounds cool, like a, like a pulled pork Hawaiian, you know, Southeast Pacific style. So I said, he told about his food truck, is sitting in the driveway, the decals aren't on yet, but I'm interested in his food truck, not just for the food, but that just sounds pretty cool. So I care about his food truck. And so I don't know where it's going to go, but I want to spend time with him. And so we're talking about his food truck in, in the cul-de-sac. You have to spend time with people and maybe just be interested in what interests them. Uh, maybe inviting them into your life, sitting in your house, having a meal, watching a football game. That's okay. Jesus did it. He didn't sin with them, but he sat with them. And a lot of us don't have unsafe friends, and we should begin to cultivate them. As, no, as talk begins every single time, something in common, some type of connections made, cultivating a friendship, get to know them, and then they trust you to listen to what you have to say about the gospel. So it's a different way of thinking. Instead of hoping people come to church, and um, we just want to be spend time with them. Sometimes it means just talking to them. And... Maybe people you just met, and you can turn the conversation not too difficultly to spiritual things. We just don't think about that. Uh, we're having our tires replaced on our camper, and uh, we bought them to what we call fast tire in Anthony. Well, you want them, to, if they say fast tire, they better be fast. You know? they, they were good to us. They fixed their flat we had once, so I brought it back. I told them we appreciated what they did, and so that's why I was back. They said, cool. So they took the camper, and 45 minutes later says, well, you're done. I said, what? He said, that's why they called us Fast Tire. He actually said that. <laughs> I said, cool. I said, I used to live in Alaska with someone near, and we had something called the Fast Alaskan, was like a, a Ketchikan version of McDonald's. It wasn't fast. Nothing is fast in Ketchikan. Everything is slow. And so it was slower than a slip down meal. He said, you're an engineer? I said, yeah. He said, my uncle used to Becca. I said, they did? I heard, he said, I worked for Astrid Girls. He said, you did? I said, yeah. He said, well, what brought you here? I said, well, I got to share my whole story of how I got heard the gospel, how I got saved, how I was a pastor, worked in the churches. And it was a start. By mentioning, oh, I know a place that says fast that isn't fast. It's just, you know, you pray. And you say, Lord, open a door today. And I prayed that day. I prayed every day. Lord, give me some conversation with people today. And they're there all the time. I'm normally too busy to even mess with them. Replace my tires. Do a good job. I want to go home. And that's how I live most of the time. And shame on me for that. Because there are open doors all, of the, all over the place. To bring a conversation. To just talk with them. And I found more people willing to just have a conversation than are not. We're putting away our camper um, last year and um, putting it away on a nice fall day and just enjoying it. And two, two or three campers over, a guy was putting away his camper. And I said, okay, I just need to at least introduce myself. So I did. I wasn't going to. I didn't want to mess with it, but I did. So I say, hi, I'm Tim. And he said, hi, I'm Jeff. And I said, how long have you been camping? We finally camped in several other places. And I asked him what he did for a living. and said, well, what do you do? I said, oh, I can tell you that. I got a whole story again. How I used to be an engineer, heard the gospel, got saved, I worked for churches, and I used to be a pastor. I said, Anthony Baptist is one of our churches, Community Baptist one of our churches. He said, you know Sean Lumper? He's a pastor of Community Baptist Church. And I said, yeah. He said, I'm his neighbor. I said, cool. He said, he's a cool guy. I said, he is. You can listen to him. So who, who knew? Just by putting away. And that happens all the time. You have to spend time with them. Invite them into your life. Do something for them. Just speak with them. Spend time with them. Number four, have to be strategic. Be strategic. You have to have some type of plan and take initiative. It isn't just going to happen typically that we get involved in people's lives. It can become that way. But in the beginning, we have to be strategic. Even Jesus had a plan. He said, I must go through Samaria in John chapter 4. I have to go through. There's a well there. I'm going to meet people there. And he met the woman at the well. She came to Christ and spread the word, and all sorts of people got saved. So I would ask you, what's your plan to connect with people, cultivate a friendship, 
engagement conversation, point of the crisis, kind of what would be your plan for that? And most people don't have one. Paul usually had a plan. He went in Acts 16. It said that he had the Sabbath day. He went outside the gate of Philippi by the riverside where he supposed there was a place of prayer and he sat down and spoke to the women who come together and Lydia got saved. He said, I think there's people praying, but let's go where the people are and see what God's going to do. The scripture says the heart of man plans his way and the Lord directs his steps. So what's your plan? To be strategic, we normally do what we intend to do. And we purpose to do with the intention. So be strategic. Uh, who would you want to reach? Where do you think you could start? What would you do if God opened the door and someone was interested? And there's a fear, a rejection, there are a lot of disappointments in witnessing to people. We've had many of them. But some have been open. Some surprisingly. And so beyond the fear of rejection, what about the fear of, of someone actually being interested? Like Philip and the eunuch. He said, hey, I'm reading a Bible, so understand it, sit with me, I, need, I have questions, you're the guy. Whoa, we've had that happen before, or we're that person. And so we have to be strategic and have a plan about making a connection, starting a conversation. A great way to start a conversation is ask somebody a question. Or say, hi, I'm Tim, what's your name, and you begin the process. How many of you find it difficult to speak to strangers? You can get over that. By introducing yourself and asking questions. It's a great way to start. Uh, when Sandy was working in Carroll at a consignment shop called Our House to Yours, right? And had a lot of women working there, and they hired Tim to take her place, and we moved to Ankeny back in 2014, or in 2014, and built a friendship with Tim, and asked her one day, Tim, could I ask you a personal question? It's a good way to start. Very non threatening. She said, Yeah, we're friends. And she'd known her for just a short time. She said, do you know for sure he died to go to heaven? Uh, not new with us, but it's a good way to ask the question. And she said, I don't. And she began to cry. Who knew? And then she said, and this was new, but she said, if you could know for sure, would you want to know? I, I wrote that one down in my baby book. That's a good question to answer. If you could know, you're testing interest. She said, I would. That was a mucker went into a little bit, but she put her trust in Christ not long after that, after birth. So we can ask people, that became our plan. We ask people questions, find something in common with them, make some kind of a connection with them. And if they are interested, we point them, we want to get them into the Word of God, where God can speak to them about what it means to be born again. It could be my testimony, and God would use that. It could use yours. It could be the, the elements of the gospel. It could be a job study. We, that's our plan. We get them into the word of God where God can speak to them to their heart. And we'd be like the eunuch or like the eunuch who are there to guide them. That's our plan. Heard of a pastor in our fellowship who was new to the fellowship, new to the area. It's a small, tiny little rural town. Not even a blip on the highway because it's not on the highway. It's a blip off the highway. And so he became the pastor there, had a heart for people, and began to connect it. So he, he kind of liked hot rods and muscle cars. So he was driving along the highway one day and saw a muscle car sitting in a guy's yard on an acres and just decided to pull in and introduce himself. Hi, I'm David. I like muscle cars. Tell me about your car. So he did. Now he had a friend. And a couple weeks later, his wife said, where's David? He was leading him to Christ for a few weeks later muscle car. But he, he, he intended to pull in. That's his plan. To find people who have something in common with, and God's arrange a meeting with them, get involved in their life, and open a door. Doesn't always happen. It always starts that way. So what's your plan? Be strategic. Can I say a plan? And no, then begin to pray for that. Number five is to share Christ with them. Eventually, we pray that God open or to share Christ with them. Now, if God doesn't open the door, don't make it happen. Don't drop their friendship. If they don't, that's just using people. Pray that God would open a door to share, to testify of Jesus to them. Or to be witnesses, to be testifiers, to speak with confidence. But we know to be true about Christ and his death on the cross for them is to share Christ with them. And in doing so, three things here. We need to be clear 
in the gospel. It declared. What is the gospel? The good news that Christ died for my sins. You have to talk about God, his holiness, the creator, accountability to him, that he must punish sin. You have to talk about sin. We're sinners by nature, by choice, deserving the wrath of God, helpless to do anything about it, and deserving exactly what we have. We have to talk about Jesus who died as God's provision for sin. Christ died for your sins. He took your place. He became God's provision. Does someone have to pay for your sin, either you or someone else, that God will accept? So the problem is sin. Christ is God's provision for sin. But you have to respond to the gospel by making it personal and having saving faith and trusting him. And those are the elements of the gospel. You have to be clear. Paul prayed that he would be clear. We also need to be patient with people. Uh, now, life is urgent. Our life is a vapor. And we can't count on tomorrow. Now, you have to worry about tomorrow, right? But life is fragile, uncertain, so there's an element of urgency to anyone trying, and not waiting any longer to be saved, but we need to be patient. How long did it take you to get for God to open your heart to understand? It took us years. And so Jesus, and Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, to be patient toward all men. With patience correcting those that oppose you, perhaps that God will grant the repentance and knowledge of the truth. And God is patient toward us, not wishing any should perish, but all can repent. So God is patient with us. It might take some time for someone to understand. Our son Danny and his wife Brenna, and uh, Brenna's mom is a believer. Her dad is not a believer in Williamsburg. It's been a long, long time that Richard's been around the gospel and still doesn't understand it, but now he's open. There's some medical things going on that have opened up his eyes to his mortality. Now he seems to be interested in the gospel. Doesn't understand it yet. But every Monday, they drive to Williamsburg and go through the strange and road to Emmaus book, and Richard's not interested in reading about the gospel. It's been, it's been years that he's not interested. And so they were patient. God's opening the door. God might use you later. God might use someone else. So be patient. Urgent. And also, let's just, just be confident. Uh, be clear. Be, patient, be confident. Paul was eager to preach the gospel from Romans chapter 1. He was not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God of salvation to those who believe. Jesus told us to be his witnesses. He told us that he would empower us, he would be with us, he would speak, he would bear witness with us. We don't apologize for the God. We're not brash and harsh and insensitive and demeaning. But I can speak with confidence. Didn't the gospel save you? If you call to the Lord, he will save you. If you come to him, he will never cast you out. If you believe, he will give you everlasting life. Isn't that true? So we speak with confidence that anyone can come to Christ. In fact, uh, one of the questions in the John studies is, does the word whosoever mean whosoever or just a few people? <laughs> well, it means whoever. We've actually worked through that question with people. What does, who, what does whoever mean? And they kind of go, like, anybody? I said, yep. And they're reluctant to believe anybody. And some say they've not sinned enough. Some they say they sinned too much. I said, no, it's not true. Anybody can come. And so we have confidence in the gospel to share Christ with them. And lastly, number six, we have to seek God for them. <clears throat> we pray for them. Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, said his heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel would be saved. His heart is our prayer. And do we share that heart desire that our neighbors would be saved and our family members would be saved and then pray for them? It's always been true of me. Sometimes I just don't think about it enough and don't care like I should. The season of life when I did and God was blessed. We, we, we pray, we, we bring them to the throne of grace on their behalf as believer priests, and we intercede for them, and we bring them before the throne, so God, would you open their heart to the gospel? Would you show me what to do next with them? I don't know what to do next, but bless my neighbor. Our neighbor to the other side that butchered their lawn, I know what to do next with them. I mean, they put their lower on, like, level number one. It's shorter than golf courses. 
And, and, and then, they, then they actually couldn't mow a straight line and then scalp my yard. So bad it bothered them. This was a turning point. I was no longer frustrated. Could I be frustrated if Sandy came up and said, oh boy, Ken, I'm not going to like this one. I'm not able to handle that well in my heart. But I just loved them. I walked over and kind of noticed it and they were embarrassed. I mean, five feet into my yard was scalped the number one. And theirs is full of weeds because they scalped it. So I said, hey, can I help you with your yard? And they were open. And they're so embarrassed about what they said. That's okay. I, I can help you fix your yard. The other guy's yard is perfect. My yard is almost perfect. And theirs is just a mess. Scalps full of weeds. Disastrous. And if for their own sake, it would be better if they were, had a better yard. And for everyone else's sake. So I said, can I help you? And they were open. And so I, I, I fertilized their yard Friday afternoon so it could rain. And now it's just got to grow again. And they said, you buy the stuff, and I, I will pay you back. I said, good. They, they don't speak a lot of English. They're from mainland China. They own a very, they have one of the best restaurants in Ankeny with the most fresh ingredients, but they have no clue about how to take care of the yard. It's an amazing thing. But they wanted me to help them. So I mowed their yard, put down the fertilizer, and they were all, I said, could I help you? And so I am helping them. The next step is to kind of fix their yard. Get over the language barrier and see if God opened a heart to so why would you care about your neighbor? That's our plan. So we're praying for them. Paul prayed that his words, words would be given him in opening his mouth boldly. He prayed that God would open a door for the word to make it clear how he ought to speak. Paul prayed for boldness and clarity and open doors for people. And so I'm praying for them again. I wasn't for a while. I was just too bitter in my heart about how they were messing with my yard. That's terrible. So who are you praying for? Um, how about praying that God would give you something to care about? And maybe you don't know who that is. Or that God would give you an open door with a neighbor that you know but don't know how to get to know better. I don't have a clue what to do with Rex next door. I, I, I don't know what to do. He kind of lives in his own world. He's not personable. He just kind of like a grouchy grump all the time, and I, but I don't know what to do next. So I pray, God, show me what to do with Rex. Jesus prayed that we, he said, pray that God would send more laborers. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are still few, but you and I can be one of the few. You know, we're his workers, we're his witnesses. God makes his appeal through us. Salvation is the work of God. That only he can do. But he's workers. So we pray for workers and boldness and open doors and clarity and wisdom. And pray for people by name. During prayer meeting time. Pray for your neighbors by name. We have been to many, many churches and not a criticism, just an observation. I guess it is a criticism. I confess that. We, we, we've seen sheets of paper of prayer requests and not one mention of praying for lost people. Either in general, like the token pray for lost, or people by name. And, and just first name. There doesn't seem to be a burden for people that are, Paul had a heart desire for that. No interceding for them publicly. No rejoicing. We were getting to know Mandy and Todd years ago, and we had our church family pray for Mandy and Todd. We had a friendship with them through our daughter Amy, and, and God opened the door to do a John study, and they came to Christ one by one. We had our church family praying for Todd and Mandy to know to do what that's next with them, and you can do so we, we bring them to the throne of grace, ask God to do a work in their heart, what to do next with them, what, how can I serve them, how can I spend time with them, how, how can I develop a friendship with them, what can I do next with them, and open a door of their heart so they become a eunuch and want answers. We don't do enough of that. I don't do enough of that. And we should. So we seek God for them. And these, I think, collectively, is what Jesus did. And having a heart for lost people. We see them as lost. We serve them. We spend time with them. We be strategic. We share Christ. And we seek God for them. And this is a good template for how to show our love for lost people. There's plenty of people that need Christ. Most people do. The way is broad that leads to destruction. So most of the people you know are not believers. 
not a church-going culture primarily, but it's uh, a culture that people still need Christ. I mean, we bring the gospel to them. So I'd like you to, today to think about what that could look like for you. And maybe it's to begin to, to pray for people by name, uh, how to spend time with people, how to serve your neighbor, who could be on that list of people. Ask God to give you someone to work with that would be open. And begin to pray and commit to have some type of a plan to bring it out for the people. God is, an, I'm a former engineer. My mind thinks logically most of the time. And we always have like plan A, B, C, D, and D just in case of how engineers might work. God doesn't have a plan B for the gospel. It's us, redeemed sinners. And these jars of clay are, we are his workers. He makes an appeal to us. Isn't that amazing? Humbling and terrifying at the same time. So we're it. And you have people that are in your world or could be in your world if we would have a burden for them. And I need it too. To encourage you today to make some type of commitment to the Lord say, Lord, I'm gonna, I want to do this today. So let's pray. Father, we thank you today for Jesus Christ who loved us in our sin. That you loved us in our sin to send to him to redeem us from our sin. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. None of us was good. None of us was righteous. None of us was seeking after you. You sought after us. You sent people into our life who cared about us, prayed for us, gave a great nervousness of heart and anxiety to at least invest in us and bring us the gospel. And because of your grace, many of us came to Christ. There might be some here today who isn't a believer. Pray that they would think about that before we go home today about the, their need for Christ. But Lord, we thank you that you love us. Help us to love people like Jesus does. Have a burden for them. And to bring the good news that we have good news to share to people that we know. Help us to be those types of messengers 